Hello and welcome to the I Am Woman Project, where every week we have deep thought-provoking and interesting conversations with thought leaders, change instigators, rule breakers and creative minds who think differently, sparking creativity and inspiration. Our special guests on our show cover a variety of topics just for you and they share their personal stories to inspire, motivate and empower you, our listener. The I Am Woman podcast is produced for your enjoyment and show notes are found at www.catherineplano.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get into the show. I have a super awesome announcement. What would you say if I could give you a chance to be mentored by the world's leading international thought leaders, authors, speakers, and change makers? It's time for you to create space for miracles with the launch of the Radical Shift Summit for anyone wanting to experience change in their lives. Commencing on the 9th of October, over an eight-day period, these global gurus will help you understand how to achieve lasting positive transformation and make a quantum leap in life and in business. The summit offers teachings and recent discoveries from the world of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, medicine, philosophy, and much more. So don't miss out. This summit is an information-packed, intensive course that will help you to understand the complex connection between your mindset and behavior. Make no mistake, this is not just a talk fest. Workshops and presentations are designed with practical everyday life tips that you can easily apply at home, work and in life. And all you have to do is go to www radicalshiftsummit.com so it's r-a-d-i-c-a-l s-h-i-f-t-s s-u-m-m-i-t dot com and grab your free pass now today we have a very special guest for you Siobhan Joyce who decided it was time someone got real about what it's like to be in business, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. Siobhan is a business mentor working with female entrepreneurs and an accomplished business speaker. By nature, she's a dreamer, strong-willed, savvy, heart-centered, a deep thinker, intelligent, yet still struggles to figure things out. Prior to leaping into the world of entrepreneurship, she invested 12 years in the corporate world, working for a range of organizations from startups to global enterprises on developing their human capital. Siobhan thinks big and has built a global brand in 50 countries and was named in the top 10 list of Australian women entrepreneurs for 2017 and has been appointed as a judge for both the Telstra Business Awards and Women's Business Awards. Essentially, Siobhan is a business geek who is all about changing thinking and thus changing the world. Time to tune into this inspirational woman. Enjoy. So today we have a very special guest for you, Siobhan Joyce. Welcome to I Am Woman Project. How are you today? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm very, very good, thank you. We were just having a bit of a chat actually and I thought we better start recording about branding and photos. But before we get into that, let's unpack Siobhan. What's your story? Um, well, I uh, grew up in country Victoria um, and out there back in the time, back in the 80s, there wasn't, entrepreneurship wasn't really a career choice um, for, you know, for me growing up. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to do something more. I always knew that there was something big for me out there. So when I turned 18, I packed everything I had into my little car 
And I travelled to Melbourne, which um, I'm not sure if you have any international listeners, but obviously that's a, a big city in Victoria. It was about three and a half hours from where I lived. And I took the first job I could find in a call centre um, and then as a receptionist, you know, answering phone calls. Um, and I put myself through university whilst working. I've got three postgraduate degrees. And the whole time, you know, I built a really successful corporate career for myself. And, and whilst I really loved my career and it's it's definitely contributed some amazing um learnings that I'm applying in my business now and with the women I work with now, I always knew that there was something missing. There was something missing in what I was doing. And a couple of years ago, I had one of these moments, which I think a lot of people have in their lives. And, you know, the women out there listening who've gone through this will definitely understand what I'm talking about. But I had one of these moments where I was like, what is my legacy? You know, what am I giving to the world um, what do I want to do to actually change the world? You know, it wasn't enough for me to just be working in the world. It was like, what impact can I actually have on um, making the world a better place? And I thought about, you know, the skills that I have, the qualifications I have and what I'm passionate about. And it brought me to a point where I realized that there was a significant problem um, in with female business owners going out and starting businesses, either because they'd been forced to because of, um, you know, the current work arrangements not being suitable, or they were kind of lured by this idea of this laptop lifestyle um, and this glamorous, you know, come and work for yourself and make lots of money and travel around the world and do all these really amazing things. Um, and that there are a lot of messages out there really sugarcoating what it was actually like being in business. Uh, and I knew this was a significant problem that was contributing to failure, particularly for women in business. And I decided that this was a problem I knew I could solve. So I went out and started a business, um, business mentoring, using a combination of coaching and, and mentoring tools to help female entrepreneurs to be successful and maximize their results in business. And then following on from that, um, a project came about with a girlfriend of mine, Jemima. We've been friends since kinder. And we would call each other, you know, talking about um, the real of being business. She's a, a serial entrepreneur. She has multiple businesses. And we started talking about the fact that, you know, there's not enough real talk out there um, about what being in business is really like. And everyone says, oh, all you need is a, a smartphone and a social media account to start a business and off you go. You don't need any money. Um, but actually to start a business, you might need those things. But to grow a business is a whole other kettle of fish entirely. And there's just far too many business owners out there crashing and burning and feeling disconnected and all alone because they feel like they're the only ones going through the entrepreneurial grind and how hard it actually is to grow a business. So we started a podcast called The Business experiment, which which documents our uh, journeys growing that podcast, but also talks about all the topics that no one else really has the courage to talk about in business. And it was a big, I guess, it was. It took a lot of courage for us to actually go out there and talk about these real experiences that we've had. It included documenting um, wins and failures, and we've had some epic public failures. Um, that we've had to then go on and talk about. But through doing that, we've actually created a whole new niche of business conversation that has brought business owners together to realize that, you know what, I'm not the only one going through these struggles. So the podcast absolutely took off and uh, my collective brands are in 50 countries as of today. Wow, that's super amazing. And uh, yes, we did have uh, Jemima on the show. And it is true, you know, it's not that... Um, you know, but people don't tell you the, I guess, how hard it was to get to where they got, you know, got to. And quite often, I even actually get that the same where people go, wow, how did you get to where you are today? Well, it took me 10 years and 10 years mm. of grit, 10 years of really hard work. Uh, some years were, you know, I was actually looking at myself thinking, what are you doing, Catherine? And wanted to throw the towel, just, you know, end it. And I'm sure this happens. Have you ever had that experience where you just wanted to like give it all up and go back to your corporate career? Uh, look, regularly, um, there's, you know, and, and let's let's be honest, there's this phenomenon called the entrepreneurial dip. And it's kind of a process that you go through. And I'm sure people have seen, you know, different graphics out there, which which kind of 
provide a visual for this. But essentially, um, what happens is, you know, as you're going through your entrepreneurial journey, you will have, uh, it's kind of like a roller coaster. So you'll have these moments where you'll be like, yes, this is amazing. This is the best thing I've ever done. And I'm really excited about this. Everything's going really well. And then all of a sudden you will, you know, crash and you'll have what's called the entrepreneurial dip. Now, the first time that you have this dip, this is the moment where you are like, oh my goodness, my business is sucking my soul. What am I doing? Why did I think this was a good idea? Um, You really get to this rock bottom place where you feel quite burnt out. The first time this happens, it's actually really scary because you don't understand what's going on. And what you actually realize and learn as you go along is that when you hit the dip, there's always some kind of genius that's going to come out of the dip. And I like to use this little story that I heard about um, by a rabbi who talks about lobsters and what happens when they outgrow their shell. And this relates to the dip. So essentially what happens is, you know, um, when the lobster starts to outgrow its shell, it starts to become uncomfortable. And when we're in this moment where we're feeling uncomfortable or when we're in the dip, it's the worst thing ever. And we might not know it or subconsciously we might suspect this is the case, but it's always about to lead to a point of transformation. And so with the lobster, what happens is they're outgrowing their shell, they're starting to feel uncomfortable, but they don't want to throw their shell off because they're comfortable and they're safe in their shell and they know that shell and they want to stick to that shell. And what happens is the more they go along, the more they become uncomfortable. And eventually they get to a point where they physically cannot stay in their shell anymore and they throw it off and they're naked and they're vulnerable and they run under a rock and they grow a new shell. Um, and when they grow the new shell, they realize, wow, this shell's really awesome. You know, I really love this shell. This is really great. Okay, well, that was painful going through that dip, going through that moment of transformation. But actually, it was totally worth it because now I have this new learning or this new growth. I have this new shell. And then what happens is you go along for a little bit longer um, and then you get to the point where you think it's the best thing ever and then you'll have another dip. Something else will happen. You'll realize you're outgrowing the shell you have again and you're like, oh, no, I have to go through this whole process all over again. Uh, And then, you know, same thing. You throw the shell off, you go under the rock and you grow a new shell. And I like to kind of relate these two things because – Um, people often misunderstand the purpose that feeling pain or discomfort has in our lives. And we spend so long trying to avoid it instead of actually understanding that some, um, some forms of pain or stress can actually just be triggers for periods of transformation. And that cannot be more true for the entrepreneurial dip, for the moments where you're like, I just want to chuck this in and go and Uber, you know, and we all have them. But the good news is, is that the longer that you go along and the more you learn about uh, how entrepreneurial dips play out for you, the more you realize that they are such a vital and important part of your entrepreneurial journey and your growth as a business owner. And that doesn't mean that they get any easier. You know, they can still be really, really difficult when you're in the moment, but you learn the perspective. You kind of become familiar with this process and the roller coaster that is, you know, the entrepreneurial journey. So you're actually using the pain to catapult you forward over time. Yeah, absolutely. So depending on what it is that's that's led to the dip, you know, there might be there's an example of an epic failure that we had with the business experiment, which was the roadshow. Um, and we, as, you know, as I mentioned before, we've recorded a whole episode on this, but we decided that we were going to um, put together this epic roadshow. We had 10 locations in 10 days or 11 days or something like that. And I'm sure Jemima probably spoke about this example as well. Um, But what actually happened was we had never done anything like this before. We've never been in media and entertainment before. We've never put together a roadshow before. And we went out and we put this roadshow together and there were a few things that we didn't get right with the roadshow. One major thing was the timing of the roadshow, which we had organised for January. 
not really giving due thought to the fact that people are away on holidays, people have just come back from Christmas holidays and all of those kinds of things. And what actually ended up happening is that the roadshow was an epic failure and we had to pull it. We had to actually say, okay, we can't do this. And in, and in doing that, we lost about $10,000 um, that we had invested into this roadshow. Now, that moment of epic public failure, because remembering we're, we're a global brand, um, was really, really painful. And that led to a pretty big dip for both of us. And that moment of what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Why are we investing all of our time and energy and money into this project? You know, what's the point of this anymore? You know, all those kind of things that come up when you're in that moment. But actually, <coughs> but actually, um, the truth of it is, is that when we went into that moment and we were real about the pain and we acknowledged the pain we were feeling and we understood that it's normal and natural to feel this pain and disappointment and we didn't try to resolve it too quickly, we didn't try to box it and sort it and get rid of it, we both actually just sat in the pain for a little bit and acknowledged to each other, you know what, this is really painful for us right now and we just need to allow ourselves to process this for a few days before we come together to talk about it. And that's exactly what we did. And we came together on the podcast to talk about this experience and the real of it and what it actually meant for us. And through doing that, we actually had business owners emailing us, getting in touch with us, you know, stopping to chat with us when they'd run into us at networking events. And they were like, you know what, I've failed worse and I've never been able to talk about it before. And now through you being able to talk about it on this public platform, um, you've given me the courage to come out and actually talk about this failure that I feel like I've failed worse than what you did. But for the first time, I can actually talk about this. And through that experience, it really reinforced to us that failures and pain, they have a purpose. They're not meant to feel good. You know, that public failure was horrific. And it's something that while we see the beauty of it um, and we're really glad it happened, it's still something that is painful for us. It's less painful now than what it was at the time, of course. But as you go along, you know, you will heal. Um, but coming out of that dip or that painful moment and that pain, we realised that the beauty in what we had actually given to the business community by um, going through that failure and publicly talking about it. So, yeah, so I think that's kind of um, – People often spend so much time avoiding pain where instead of understanding that we have a range of emotions for a reason, including pain, and it doesn't mean that it's pleasant because it's absolutely not, but it's about understanding um, the beauty that it gives you and the growth that it gives you. Mm, and, and I think that that's also our default position. That's the way that we've been, I guess, um, when we're, from a neuroscience perspective, we lean towards pleasure and move away from pain. Mm. When in actual fact, when you actually look at pain and failure as part of your day-to-day, -day, so I always say fail, but let's fail fast. And you know, what, will our, what were our learnings and lessons from uh, failure? See, I, I, with, with myself and my team, we always say there is no such thing as failure. It's feedback. So when things don't work out, let's do the whole reverse engineering piece and look at it and go, okay, what went on? And, you know, and it always goes back, goes back to, you know, we knew from the start, we had, a, we had this uh, inclination or a gut feeling that this was not going to go uh, as planned and not work out, but we ignored what our gut feeling or our intuition was telling us. But mm. you know, we were moving forward for whatever reason, and um, and you know, and for 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 me, it's very very much so. What did I learn from that experience so that next time I do it differently? Yeah, and I think sometimes people um, try to move too quickly into the learning phase so people will um like i think at a high level people understand that there is going to be learning out of pain but they instead of allowing themselves to process it and giving themselves like accepting that this is how they feel about it and being kind to themselves and giving them the opportunity to actually go through feeling the pain often people will be um, very, very quick to try and jump into what the learning is, mm. to try and avoid the pain, to try yeah. and kind of hurry the pain along. Um, when in reality, I mean, obviously, you know, you don't want to 
sit and wallow, you know, that's not what we're talking about. But it, it's about understanding that it's okay to feel that pain and you don't need to jump too quickly into no. what you've learned about it. Um, and what else was I going to say? Sorry, I just realised something else. Yeah, I no, forgot. No, no, it's, it's I totally agree with you. Like with emotion, you don't push them aside, absolutely not. And it's not what mm. I'm saying. I'm For me, very much so, if you're feeling down, embrace it, you know, but give yourself a time limit. So when things fail for me, I go, okay, it's all right to feel sad, upset, because uh, I've also lost lots of money, um, but give myself a timeline. So I go, you know, I'm, I'll be like this for at least 24 hours and then I'll revisit where I am. You know, I make sure that I allow myself to go through the pain, but I give myself some time to do it as well because I think mm. sometimes it could almost – that perpetual vortex where you kind of start digging a hole for yourself and feeling a victim and feeling sorry for yourself. And, you know, the, that could be the the energy you draw towards you if you don't go, you know, okay, I'll give myself a day, two days, three days, whatever it is, um, and then I'll get, you know, put my head up again and let's see what I can uh, do to help myself move forward. Absolutely. And I think the other thing is is that – it's important to understand in business that success and failure aren't mutually exclusive um, and they're both temporary. So, um, you know, just remember that when you have a failure, it's going to be temporary and it's actually going to be part of your success. And the same thing is with success. And and I think this is where a lot of business owners uh, kind of go wrong as well, is that they kind of feel like there's a destination made it. And they feel like, like once I'm successful, you know, once I've got there, wherever there is, I can just sit back and relax and, you know, I don't have to worry about anything anymore because I will be a success. I will have made it. And that is one of the biggest mistakes they can make and also one of the fastest ways to fail because there are so many stories out there of businesses and business owners and entrepreneurs who have um, being of the impression that they've reached destination, made it, and become complacent about where they are. And then they've ended up, like their business has ended up um, dissolving into the abyss or they've ended up um, failing in some really crucial way because they've misunderstood that whilst failure is temporary, um, success is also. So it's just a part of the journey. That's right. And you know, that's a really important point when you're talking about success because sometimes, and I've seen this a lot in entrepreneurs and with businesses where they've been very successful at one thing and, and in like you, you said, they've celebrated the success and it's, they're, they're stuck on their success and they mm. become complacent, like you said, um, and they don't um, cause I think it, as an entrepreneur, as a business, you've got to be constantly fluid, flexible, moving, uh, changing direction, depending on where you're, which direction you're getting pulled towards. Because sometimes we have this grand idea or this, uh, you know, or big audacious goal as to where we need to go. Uh, and sometimes it pulls us in a different direction. And I think that mm. if we don't remain flexible or fluid in business, we could lose opportunities because we are stuck, have this stuck mindset as to the direction we need to head into. A hundred percent. I like to liken business to a toddler, you know, and Jemima and I laugh all the time that um, business can be like a toddler who wants to wear, you know, her tights on her head as opposed to putting them on her legs. Um, and, you know, if your business is that toddler that wants to put wear the tights on her head, then, you know, you need to uh, let your business be what it wants to be. There are far too many people, you know, to touch on your point, who are so fixated on the way things should be and the way they want things to go as and they're closing themselves off to the opportunities that are already there for them that are even better um, than what they could have imagined if everything had gone to plan. Mm. And I'm really curious, Siobhan, because you were talking about the dip before and we all go through the dips. Mm -hmm. What is that thing for you that drives you forward or out of the dip? What, what's that trick for you? This is going to sound cliche, but it's 100% the truth. Um, what, what keeps me going in the moments when uh, you have those rock bottom times is really – um, the clients that I work with and seeing how the work I do impacts them in a positive way. Um, I kind of liken working with um, female entrepreneurs and helping them 
to succeed in business as like mining for diamonds. Um, and in those moments, you know, I always like to reflect on, okay, well, even though this feels really bad now, you know, how far have you progressed? Who are you actually helping? What does, what, like what you're doing, what does that mean to the people that you're working with? And if you were to give up now, what impact would that have on them? And what impact would that have on, you know, all the women in the future who wouldn't get the opportunity to work with you? And that honestly is what keeps me going. It's what gets me through. And then when I, when I, and that takes conscious, like I consciously have to remind myself of that. Um, And then when I get through it, I'm like, I am so grateful you know like as painful as that growth period was look at all the great stuff that you're actually achieving for all the business owners out there um and it's a great way to remind myself of the purpose of why I'm going through this pain you know if I had to um go through everything that I've gone through personally and professionally over the past couple of years to get to this point where I am now and helping the women that I'm I'm helping I would do it I would do it all over again because it's totally worth it so yeah, that's that's how I help to get myself through. I love that. And it all, actually, mining for diamonds reminds me, and I can't remember who said it. Whether it was a Car- Carnegie Carnegie Hill or Napoleon, no, sorry, Napoleon Hill and Andrew Carnegie, they were saying that you know um, when you get through, when you get into that moment where you just want to give it all up, just remember you are three feet away from gold. And they tell you a whole story about it. So for me, it's always about like what you're saying. You know, searching for the gold. When you get to that point where you want to give up. Remember, you're just three feet away from gold. So it's very aligned with what you're saying, uh, mining for diamonds. I love that. Mm. So with the benefits of hindsight, would you have done anything differently with your career or your business? I would have believed in myself more even when no one else believed in me. And that has been the biggest learning uh, in my journey uh, in entrepreneurship and and also I think in my corporate career but remembering you know I had a very successful corporate career and I have a successful career in entrepreneurship but I think in the beginning and all the women out there who are listening to this will undoubtedly have had similar experiences and if you haven't then this is likely coming up for you so it's good that you're hearing this now in that uh, as you go through your entrepreneurial journey and building your business, you are always going to have the critics. And you really need to love these critics. As painful as it is, you know, leading back to um, what we were just talking about in terms of, you know, growth through pain, you really need to appreciate and love your critics for what they actually give you in terms of building your resilience and your strength in business. And sometimes they come from a place of love And sometimes they actually don't. And it's really important to learn to understand where they're actually coming from. But one of the ways that your critics can come out, and and the more that you grow your profile, the more successful that you become, the more that this will happen. And they will make comments like, so a couple of comments that um, have occurred throughout my career is I had someone say to me, you know, why why would any woman want to sign up Um, to, you know, do business mentoring with you when you're not actually a successful entrepreneur yourself. Now, that blew my mind because, first of all, um, success is subjective. And personally, I do consider myself quite a successful entrepreneur. Um, Am I a Richard Branson? No. But have I successfully grown businesses and have I actually helped women to successfully grow their business and maximize their results? Absolutely. Um, The results speak for themselves. But that comment really, really hurt. It hurt a lot. It kind of knocked me for six. But the beauty in it is that it's, it forced me to stop and think about, you know, what does success actually mean? What does it actually look like? What is it that my clients uh, need from me and what problems do I solve for them? And how do I actually help them be successful in their business? Because ultimately, this is about them. Um, and also, you know, just because that person doesn't consider me to be a successful entrepreneur doesn't mean that I'm not a successful entrepreneur. And so it really forced me to think about and to separate what other people's opinions are of me versus 
what I truly believe um, I have and what I can offer for my clients. And I mean, in 2017, I was named as one of the top 10 Australian female entrepreneurs. So, you know, um, that was a really, really important lesson. The other one that happened was um, when we decided we were going to go out and start our podcast, we actually had a male person that we know in our network make the comment to us, well, why is anyone going to want to listen to two women talking about business? And that, again, was really, really painful. It was like, wow, you know, I can't like, and and, and again, we had a moment we were like, you know what, we don't care what you're going, what you say about this. Um, we actually believe in ourselves and we believe in our message and we believe in what we have to offer. And we're going to go out and do that anyway, even if you don't believe in us. And I think I had that as well in my personal business. You know, people are always, not, not everyone is going to love what you do. As long as you believe in what you do and your clients believe in what you do, that is the number one most important thing. And so with, with, both of those examples, you know, I acknowledge them. I acknowledge how painful they were. I thought about what that has taught me and I went on and I worked even harder. And the result of that is I believe I have been even more successful because of them. Mm. But back in the beginning, I wish I had have understood more that people's, you know, external validation, what other people think of you is just their opinion. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's truth. And there are going to be times in your business when people um, troll you, when people judge you, when people make comments, and often their comments, and it's so true when people say this, often the comments that people make to you and about you are more a reflection of their own fears and inadequacies than actually a reflection of you. And so in that moment, and there are going to be moments in your business where you need to believe in yourself more than anybody else believes in you. And I honestly think that, you know, when you look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs of our time, including Daniel Flynn from Thank You, who we had on our podcast, um, and Thank You to Social Enterprise for those people who haven't heard of it before. He and and not just Daniel, but the co-founders there, they were working three jobs for, I think it was like three or five years or something to get thank you off the ground. And one of the key uh, things that made them as successful as they are is that they believed in themselves and they believed in their mission and what they wanted to offer to the world, even when no one else out there believed in them. And everybody, you know, said to them, you're never going to be successful at this. You know, you've got multi-million dollar Um, beverage companies that you're going up against. You're just kids. You're never going to do this, never going to get it off the ground. And that unwavering belief um, is what drove them through. And now, you know, I think Thank You has um, donated, I think it's over $4 million or something like that to fund projects in Australia and overseas to help people who don't have clean drinking water or um, medical access to medical help and things like that. So I think... For anyone out there who has had this experience already or, you know, is beginning their career in entrepreneurship, just understand that this will likely happen to you. And I want you to remember this moment, have a moment where, you know, you go back to believing in yourself more than anybody else believes in you. And it's not a reflection of you, these people's comments. Mm, it's so true and what a great, great um, thing to bring up because I think that also even with me when I have had, I call them receiving feedback because uh, mm. it helps me um, not uh, get stuck in the problem. So I'm always curious, you know, I, I go back to them and ask them, you know, what is it exactly, for example, what is it exactly that um, um, you are after? I mean, what does success mean to you? Please, you know, shine some, shine some light on that so I can learn from you. So I think all feedback is great feedback because like you said it helps you assess um where you're at i i think it also it's it's one of those things that you also um can't please everybody not Mm. everyone's going to love you and no one's not everybody's going to be aligned uh to what you do but the ones Mm. that are i mean they're your tribe they're your loyal customers that will back you a hundred percent yeah and i think it's about deciding you know what is worth what feedback is worth going back to and Mm. finding out more about and what feedback is not about you and more about the other person. Mm. Um, You know, if you've got feedback coming from people who have your best interests at heart and are big champions for your success or you have feedback coming back from your clients, you know, that's one thing. But 
it's also about understanding, you know, what are you going to invest time and mm-hmm. energy into? And I think one of the biggest lessons in all of this for me was um, realising that, you know, as you said, Catherine, you're not going to please everybody. And one of the biggest things you need to let go of if you're going to be successful in this is people pleasing and understanding that this is not about you. This is about the mission that you're out to achieve. You know, for me personally, this is about the women that I help to be successful in business. And it's it's something, it's a it's a purpose that is bigger than myself. And that comes with sacrifices. And that includes letting go of pleasing everyone. Because if I was so concerned about pleasing everyone, I would never be the business mentor that I am today. And women come to work with me specifically because of the business mentor that I am, like they would come to work with you because of who you are as well and what you offer, Catherine. Mm. So, um, you know, yeah, letting go of people pleasing um, is one of the biggest sacrifices that, that you'll need to make and just believe believe in yourself and believe in in what you have to offer. Mm, Absolutely. You have to back yourself 100%. So the other thing Mm. we love to unpack a little bit in every business and every individual and every entrepreneur has a pain point. What would be some of your or one of your biggest pain point in your business? Um, This is something that, sorry, I just need to cough. (coughs) This is something that I didn't see coming, this pain point that happened in my business uh, and that is that in my business, you know, I'm, I call myself a business mentor, but I use a combination of coaching and mentoring tools. And this is something that I've refined over time. You know, when I first went out, I was using um, coaching solely as an expertise with my clients and I was mentoring separately. And then I realized that actually where the true beauty is and where my clients, my ideal clients get the most benefit is when I use a combination of both. Um, But when I went out there in the market and started a business, um, you know, essentially being a business coach or a business mentor for female entrepreneurs, I realized that um, coaching and mentoring have not a great image in the market. So there's a lot of people out there and you see this all the time, you know, entrepreneurs, there's messages out there in the entrepreneurial community um, where people will talk about the terrible experiences that they had working with business coaches or business mentors. And, you know, it was a waste of money. I didn't get the results that I, that I expected um, that, you know, they, they sold me this shiny package and it didn't turn out to be what I had expected it would be. And um, because I was in this industry, you know, I was in this group of experts, I unwittingly became lumped. And, and a lot of – there's some amazing, talented – um, experts out there, business coaches and mentors who would blow your socks off with the results that they can deliver for their clients. But along with that, there are a lot of people who just roll out of bed one day and decide they're going to be a coach without truly understanding. They have no qualifications. They don't truly understand the expertise and what it takes to be successful in this field and what it takes to actually deliver real results for clients. And what I realized is that, you know, there are a few few um, factors that were contributing to this. And I think the first thing is that people out there weren't really understanding how to choose the right expert to help them. They kind of thought that business coaches and mentors were all the same. They all offered the same thing. They all focused on the same thing. They all had the same qualifications. And in reality, um, different experts in this field have different qualifications, different methodologies, different areas of specialty, different approaches um, in how they work with their clients. And one of the key issues I was finding is that, you know, when you started talking to people about the problems that they were having, um, you know, in that, oh, you know, I didn't get the results. I hired a business coach. I didn't get the results that I wanted. And it was like, okay, well, tell me about that experience. What actually happened? It was like, oh, well, it was group, it was group coaching. And really, uh, group coaching isn't right for me. It wasn't, I needed one-on-one, you know, or they specialized in online, building an online business. But actually, I don't want to be- build an online business. I want to build a bricks and mortar business. You know, and so what I realized is that people don't understand 
how to choose the right expert for them. And the more that I started talking to people about this, um, the more I inadvertently started to become somebody who people turn to to um, talk about, you know, how to get the most out of coaching and and mentoring um, in business. And going out there, I just recently did an article with Fem Economy talking to female entrepreneurs about uh, how to choose the right mentoring expert for you and to give examples of real results that women have achieved through our mentoring work together. Um, so it was almost like my biggest pain point in the beginning in that it, it was an untrusted profession in the market. And when people would hear about what I was doing, they kind of roll their eyes like, oh, you're one of those people, you know, you're one of those people. Um, and that was a huge pain point. Um, the trust in the market about coaching and mentoring has actually turned into this most amazing thing because now people will come to me and, and ask me, you know, oh, can you comment on this? I'd love to hear your thoughts about this experience. And I've been able to actually um, educate the market in a way, and I continue to do that all the time. In that, even if you know, even if I'm not the right mentor or coach for you, I have a network of amazing experts who can help you achieve what it is you want to achieve. But also, here is the real of when you choose the right person who has the right qualifications. Here's the real of what the impact, like what impact they can actually have on your business. And it's kind of funny because it's kind of like, you know, people go out there and they might have a bad experience with a mechanic, but they don't rule out all mechanics. You know, it's kind of like, well, that mechanic wasn't great, but I'm going to go and find another mechanic. It's about understanding that mechanics are an important expertise that you need to, you know, service and maintain your car. And it was trying to get people to understand that by choosing the right business mentor or coach or expert, you know, regardless of who that was, that 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 actually is a valuable um investment and something that you can get real results from and get a good return on investment from. So, yeah. Mm, and, and what a great um, point to bring up because there, you know, when you think about it, the market is flooded with coaches. You can get a coach for speaking business. And, yes, it's it. I think it's about getting down to specifics. So, for example, I'm very much about neuroscience, neuromarketing, uh, changing your mindset. But if anybody speaks to me about – uh, online marketing or social media, then I would refer them to uh, somebody that works within that specific area for their business. Mm. Uh, and it's true. It's I think people have a bad experience with someone and then they just write it off. I will never go to a business coach again when in actual fact it's just they have just haven't gone to the right one. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Yeah. So the next thing um, I'd love to sort of unpack is what do you think is the number one reason most entrepreneurs fail to succeed in business? Uh, I think first of all, it is because there is this sugar-coated image of what it really is like to be in business, which, you know, we are and I personally am and we are with our podcast changing you know, opening that conversation about how difficult it actually is to grow a business. But I think first and foremost, people are going out into business with false expectations around what it's actually going to be like for them. And, you know, these industry experts out there who are talking about how it's never been a better time to start a business and you just need a social media account and a smartphone, they're contributing to these um, misconceptions out there. And so people aren't prepared. You know, I've been at breakfast where I've heard successful entrepreneurs say, oh, you only need three months worth of salary to start your business. And it's like, no, you need to be able to fund the growth of your business for the first 12 months to two years um, at a minimum Mm. in order to be successful in this. And people are going out there, they're starting businesses with no money. They're um, not understanding that, you know, growing a business costs money. Um, You need to invest in the right things to actually, there's a difference between hard work and overwhelm and burnout. I think that's really important. So a lot of people are going out there, they don't, their expectations aren't aligned. And then they spend the first 12 months to two years totally burnt out um, in their business and trying to figure out what they're doing wrong when actually um, if they had have been more prepared about what it was going to be like, they would have been able to make some better decisions in the beginning about where they were going to invest their time and money 
in order to help them progress their business where they want them to go. I think that's the the first one. Mm. But the second one is, and this is something you know we spoke about before I got on the podcast, is that um, I really truly believe what separates the 80% of business owners that fail from the 20% who succeed is their willingness to invest in solving problems. Now, uh, a lot of people will go out there and claim that they're problem solvers. You know, they'll be like, yeah, I solve problems. You know, I understand. I'm curious. I'm innovative. You know, I'm, I'm all about solving problems. But when it really comes down to it in the face of problems, you'll also hear these, these same people saying, you know, oh, it's too hard. It's too expensive. It takes too long. You know, it's everyone else's fault. You know, that's, that's not my fault. It's the market's fault. You know, the market isn't ready for the product. So it's their fault. It's not actually my fault in that I'm not connecting um, with my ideal buyers in a way that is actually going to help them make a buying decision. Um, we also hear a lot of, you know, um, I've tried that and it didn't work. You know, I've invested in something and I got burnt, so I'm not going to invest in in anything else. Um, and this is actually what leads to failure. They're so focused on the problem as opposed to focusing on solving the problem. And they fail to recognize that at every stage of business, you are going to encounter problems and every problem is solvable. Um, whether you solve it or not depends on your willingness to invest in solving the problem. And I think successful entrepreneurs understand there's an unspoken rule. They automatically understand that every problem that they encounter in business is solvable. How they're going to solve it is the question in their mind. And they also understand that regardless of whether it takes you know, one attempt to solve the problem or 1,500 attempts to solve the problem or if, you know, they might um, – need to choose one particular, you know, type of help or expertise or solution or whatever it might be to help them solve part of the problem. And then they understand that, okay, I've solved part of this problem now, but now I need to solve the next part of this problem. So I'm going to go and invest in this to solve that problem. You know, regardless of the journey in solving the problem, they understand that the problem is solvable. And I think when it comes to business failure, it's really important for people to think about, you know, if you're not willing to invest in solving the problem that's totally fine but the problem is not going to solve itself and those who truly truly want to be successful in business will um invest in solving problems and in doing that you know in investing in solving problems it's really important to understand and to really take stock of what actually is the problem that you need help solving and who or what solution is going to be the best to help you actually solve that problem and then how are you going to implement that learning into your business in a way that solves your problem and I think if you've invested in things in the past that haven't helped you to solve your problem it's one of those three points that has been missed either you didn't understand the problem you didn't invest in the right person or thing or solution or whatever it might be to solve the problem or you weren't able to implement the learning into your business in a way to solve the problem. So everyone out there, just remember that all problems are solvable. And that's kind of mind blowing when you think about the potential of where that could take you in your business. Mm, I love that. We do something similar. We actually say there is no such thing as a problem, only opportunities. And I think that what happens is, and this is just from learning over, you know, being in business for 10 years, that I think that sometimes when we look at a problem and go, this is a problem. Sometimes we all get involved in the problem. We get stuck in the problem and kind of make the problem work. Worse. Whereas mm. we, when it comes, you know, when a problem, if you want to call it a problem, uh, presents, we go, great, this is an opportunity. So it kind of mm. shifts your mindset to, okay, so how are we going to fix it? Who can we get involved and what's the solution here? So it does help us move forward. Mm, absolutely. And here's a, here's a classic example that uh, I hear quite a lot is women who say things like, yeah, I'm really struggling with generating cash flow in my business and I've tried this and this and this and this and this and I can't, I just cannot generate cash on my business and I've been going through this for a year but I'm not willing to invest um, money, time, energy or strategy into solving my cash flow problem, right? Mm. And this happens a lot and it's like, okay, in order to solve your cash flow problem, you need to invest in the right person or the right solution that's going to actually help you solve the cash flow 
problem. And there's this big misconception out there that, you know, everyone should be able to solve their own problems for free. And actually, this is leading to a lot of failure because women are out there feeling like they shouldn't have to ask for help. You know, you hear all the time people saying things like, oh, well, I built a successful business without having to invest in coaching or mentoring. And it's like, just because one business owner hasn't had to invest in something doesn't mean that you know, it's not worth you investing in it. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you're not talented or capable. You know, if you're struggling to generate cash flow in your business and connect with your ideal buyers, it's just it just means that there is something that you need to develop and that you need to learn and a problem that needs to be solved. And in reality, yes, it can seem, you know, um, like a big investment, you know, investing in someone to help you solve that. But if you invest in the right person, the results that you get back in your business including the gener- the cash flow that you'll end up generating will far outweigh what your original investment is. So, um, yeah, it's really important to be committed to solving mm. problems. Oh, I agree. And I, I think everybody needs a coach or a mentor because, you know, we all have blind spots and sometimes mm. it's we that gets in, get in the way of us solving a problem. So um, I don't mm. – I don't – claim to do it on my own I have a coach Mm. and a mentor and always have and I think that that's Mm. really important for everybody to have a coach I mean you hear about people that do self-coaching I mean that's great but that's not for everybody and for me it's more I'm curious to find out how do you then um, unlock those unconscious and limiting beliefs that you have that you're not even aware of so yeah absolutely totally and I also have a a mentor who who um, is uh, uses a combination of coaching and mentoring, so similar approach to what I use with my clients. Um, and I totally believe with be, like believe in, in what you're saying in terms of um, even experts who are focused on um, developing people in their business need to invest in their own development. I think that is crucial. So if there are any coaches or mentors out there who are listening to this, if you're not investing in your own development, then you're limiting your potential in terms of what you can achieve for your clients and for your business. So, yeah, it's 100% necessary and important. So, Siobhan, as we wrap up the show, we always love to ask our woman of inspiration to pick one word that best describes her personal brand. So what would be that one word for you? This is actually a made-up word. (laughs) I love Um, made-up words. (laughs) Um, And this is a word I made up myself, and it's called powerability. And I really believe that powerability is the essence of what it tra- what it takes to be truly successful as a female entrepreneur in business. And powerability is, I, I've created a private Facebook group called Powerability with Siobhan Joyce. It's by application only. And I, I created this because I wanted to create this space where, um, I could help female entrepreneurs understand how to harness their own power and empower themselves to be successful in their business. And there's lots of different elements that make up powerability, um, the word, you know, the definition of that word, a lot of which we've spoken about today, you know, being invested in solving problems um, and believing in yourself and really creating or establishing yourself as a powerful leader and expert in your field is another one that I that I talk about a lot. Um, and it's really about being able to power on like that. That's what I say, you know, being able to grow yourself, solve problems, um, and be successful and focus on your success. So focus on solving problems as opposed to uh, problems themselves. Mm, Love it. And the other thing we do as we wrap up the show, we always love to ask our woman of inspiration to leave our listeners with three shiny golden nuggets. So what would be those three shiny golden nuggets that you would like to leave for our listeners today? I think I've spoken about a couple of them already, Mm -hmm. um, being solving problems. That that is what will separate you from the 80% who fail. Yep. Um, and believing in yourself when no one else believes in you and having the courage to do that. I think another one, um, I probably have four actually, (laughs) 
I think another one, another one I'd like to share is uh, something. This is a, a quote. It's I'm, I'm quoting myself. I hope that's okay. Absolutely. But this is something I share with clients all the time. But it is the worst they can say is no, and the best they can say is yes. And I feel like a lot of the time, female entrepreneurs out there are so afraid. They, they're driven so much by fear of actually putting themselves out there, of going out there, and you know, uh, approaching that client, going out there and approaching the opportunity because they're so afraid of what would happen if they said no instead of thinking about you know what could happen if they actually said yes and I always like to remind people is that you know when you're going out there when you're when you're putting yourself forward for that opportunity when you're starting that new project you know the worst that they can say is no but the best they can say is yes and I think every you know some of the most amazing entrepreneurs we've had on our podcast like Lisa Song Sutton for example who's a serial entrepreneur she won Miss Nevada, who's a writer for Forbes, Um, how it actually came about that we were connected is that I actually reached out to her on Instagram and it wasn't this kind of salesy post. I, I reached out to her and I was like, hey, I really love what you're doing. Here's what I really love about it. And she wrote back and was like, hey, I'd love to learn more about what you're doing. And we started chatting and she was like, I I have to, I want to be on your podcast. Like mm. I have to be on the podcast. And I was like, wow, that's totally amazing. And so in that moment, you know, I realized that the worst that could have happened is that she didn't respond to me. Yep. And if she didn't respond to me, she wouldn't be the kind of entrepreneur that I would want to be connected to um but the best that she best that could have happened is that she could have responded to me and I went into that you know I don't know what opportunities could have come out of that I went into that you know contacting her because I admired everything that she was about and it actually turned into a really amazing and brilliant opportunity where I got to talk to her and learn all about what has made her successful um, and to share that with our listeners. So the worst they can say is no, the best they can say is yes. So true. The last, I love them. Yeah, the last one is, and I, I see that female entrepreneurs get this wrong a lot of the time, and this is a quote by Gary Vaynerchuk, um, who is quite a successful entrepreneur out there. Now, he people have mixed, uh, uh, you know, mixed ideas on what they think of Gary. He can be quite out there, right? But he comes out with some amazing pieces of gold. And I think that one of the biggest pieces of gold that I've heard him say, which I actually apply in my business every day, is um, the best marketing strategy ever is to care. It's to care about your customers more than anything else. When you're out there in everything that you're doing, when you're talking to potential customers, when you are working with your current customers, the best marketing strategy you can have is to care about them. Everything that I do in my businesses is for the customer. Everything, everything I talk about is always about them. Everything I do is always to benefit them. I'm not one of these people who has all of these different marketing tactics like tactics and strategies in place because all the marketing experts tell me that I should. I am out there doing what works and what's beneficial for my ideal buyer. And that has been a big contributor to my success. So yeah, that's something else I'd like to to share. Thank you so much. Uh, Siobhan, where can our listeners find you? What's the best place? Yeah, so they can head over to my website, which is SiobhanJoyce.com. I have all of the podcasts on there uh, and videos as well. So I do video marketing every week. I have thousands of women who tune in on my Facebook page, Siobhan Joyce, to watch my videos and everything that you know I do and all of my resources and everything are there on SiobhanJoyce.com. So that's the best place. <laughs> Thank you so much for your wealth of wisdom and you're so young too. You know, I just, I was blown away by your knowledge. So thank you so much for your time, your energy, and I know our listeners will absolutely adore you. So thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine, and thanks to everybody out there who took the time to listen today. Thank you. That brings us to the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed the show as it is my mission to reach out and inspire as many individuals like you. And one of the best ways to help us achieve this goal is by giving us a good review on iTunes. It's easy and it only takes about 10 seconds. If you have any questions 
or special guests that you would like to hear from, please send us an email to support at katherineplano.com.au and we will get right back to you. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook at Catherine Plano. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Until next week, please take care.